Okay, so uh, this is where we stopped yesterday. Um, we were discussing a few algorithms which fall in each of these categories. Um, and there are a few interesting algorithms, mostly in the sorting area, which have n log n complexity. Um, we'll talk about heap sort, merge sort, quick sort uh, eventually. Um, but that's something that you have to remember. Um, why we are we why we have this chain here is just to see you know what kind of operations lead to what kind of complexity, right? So there is a, a lot more stuff we'll discuss in this course, and we want to see uh, where each thing fits, right? For example, if we are coming up with an algorithm which is let's say here two power n, right? Just before uh, n factorial, so we want to see hey how can I improve from two power n? Right? How, how can I probably make it uh, n square, or how, how can I make it n log n, or how can I make it order of n, and so on. And to do that, I need to know what exactly leads to these kind of complexities. Right? If I know that a sorting, a reasonable sorting technique takes n log n, then probably I'll consider sorting it before coming up with a with an algorithm which is uh, like exponential, which is like two power n. Right? So that is the idea behind this slide. So we just know that uh, mentally we are prepared to bring down the complexity using some uh, techniques, all right? So yeah, n log n is the complexity that you will typically see when you sort. That's the takeaway. Any questions from the previous class? We talked about counting sort, binary search, uh, BST search. Like when you say uh, BST search, it's the same as binary search, right? A BST is a, a binary search tree. It is a... Um, let me show you the tag. Right, so here you see a BST. Yes. Right. So it is rooted at ten, and all the elements in the left subtree are smaller than ten. And are lower all, than ten. Yeah, smaller or lower than ten, and all the elements in the right subtree are greater than ten, and that property has to hold at all nodes. Yeah, so it's a recursive property of sorts, yeah. Right. So the complexity of searching something in a balanced binary search tree is log n base 2. And we talked about it in the, in the previous class, why it is log n base 2. And remember, we, we, we are stressing on the fact that it is a balanced BST. Right. What happens right, if right. it is not a balanced BST, if it is just a BST? Let's see what happens. Okay, let me just uh, draw that. So I have one, two, three, four, five. Right? Is this a valid BST? Yeah, it's a valid BST. Right? Because everything to the right is greater, and there is nothing to the left to violate the property. Right? So it is a valid BST. However, if you are searching for six, like what happens if you are searching for six? You start here. You say, oh, 6 is greater than 1, so let me go to the right, right? So now there is nothing that you are really eliminating from the problem space because there was no problem to the left. Likewise, when you you move from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, and then you figure out, oh, there is no right child, so 6 does not exist, right? So eventually what happened is you ended up going over the entire BST anyways, right? So if there were n nodes, a big right, so if there were n nodes, it was anyway order of n. Which is why the terms are used very, very carefully in interviews, right? You have to always see what the interviewer is saying. Is it a balanced BST or is it just a BST? Or is it just a binary tree, right? Sometimes they may just say it's a binary tree. So you cannot assume that it is actually a BST. A binary tree just says there are two nodes uh, at most, left and right check, coming back. Let's look at uh, the next complexity here. In the chain, which is polynomial. Anything uh, uh, which looks like n square, n cube, n power 4, etc., is uh, classified as a polynomial algorithm. Now, there are some sorting techniques which are not very great, which fall in this category uh, insertion sort, selection sort, bubble sort. Right? Those things, in the worst case, take n square operations, order of n square operations. And um, if, you, if you have code like this, for example, let me show you this 
here. So what we are trying to do here, this is a C++, uh, C++ uh, code snippet here, is basically print all possible pairs in that array. Right? So you have an array which is uh, five elements, and we want to pair one with uh, each of uh, two, three, four, five. Then we want to pair two with three, four, five. We want to pair three with four, five, like that. Right? So um, a nice way of getting the length of an array in C, C++ is to basically get the size of the array itself, and then divide it by the first, uh, uh, the size of the first element. Size of the entire array divided by size of the first element will give you the number of elements in the array. Now we have an outer loop here. The index goes from 0 all the way to length minus 1. So the valid index is the last, the greatest valid index is length minus 1. Likewise, we are taking another uh, inner for loop here, uh, and the index is j. It goes from i plus 1 all the way till the end, the last valid. Right? And then we just print the a i and a j. So we are printing the element pointed 2 by i and the element pointed 2 by j. Right. So this, if you just quickly run it, is giving us all possible pairs from that array. Right. So now, how do we compute the complexity of this kind of uh, code? So for each iteration, it's like uh, it goes like n iterations in the first try, and then n minus one, n plus n minus two, and so on, and then you sum it up. Correct. See. Correct. So when i is 0, j goes from i plus 1 all the way till length minus 1, right? So imagine here, i is here, and j is going from this uh, location, which is pointing to 2, all the way up to the location, which is pointing to 5. So there are n minus 1 possibilities for j when i is fixed here. Then when i moves here, there are n minus 2 possibilities for j. Right? And then n minus 3, then n minus 4, so on. And there's only one possibility for j. So which is basically a summation of 1, 2, n minus 1. So now that is basically nothing but your n into n minus 1 by 2. This is basically your uh, summation, right? Where you go from 1 to n minus 1. Right? n into n plus 1 by 2. So since we are going till n minus 1, then plus 1 of this is n. Right? So in this case, n is 5, 5 times 4 by 2. Right? Just 10. Right? See, so the number of elements you get, uh, the number of pairs you would have gotten would be 10. You just count them. Right? Another way to look at it is how to choose two numbers from the given array, right? Eventually, what we are printing is all outcomes when you choose two numbers from the back, which has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, which is nothing but your NC2. We will look at permutations and combinations in detail, uh, but if you if you can recall, that is nothing but uh, choosing, choosing two items from n items, right? Which is nothing but your uh, n factorial by n minus 2 factorial times 2 factorial, right? So these things are same. This and this is exactly the same, right? So let's, let's expand this. Like, what is this looking like? We, we want to uh, get the complexity, right? We don't want the number of, we don't want the absolute value. We want the complexity. So this turns out to be your n squared minus n by 2. Right? So in terms of order, what would be the order? We saw it in the, in the previous session. Whenever you have this kind of expression, what is what will be the big O? This is basically the expression. This can be classified as big O of n squared. So the, the largest exponent, basically. All right. So likewise, you could have n cube algorithms. Uh, for example, your matrix multiplication, right? A typical matrix multiplication would be n cube. Um, so those are all called polynomial, right? When you hear the word polynomial, this is what you should uh, understand.
Okay. The next class of algorithms uh, are known as exponential algorithms, like 2 power n, 3 power n, right, where n becomes an exponent. Right? Um, typically, uh, you will see those kind of complexities when you are trying to do combinations, when you are trying to generate all possible combinations out there. Uh, in other words, you, you are trying to do some brute force. Um, and another class of uh, algorithms uh, will give you factorial kind of outcome. This is yet another brute force technique. For example, if you are looking at all possible permutations, right, you will come up with a, a factorial complexity. So the idea of this course is to basically go from bad to good, go from your brute force approach to as close as possible to constant algorithms using data structures and algorithms and math of course right so we saw what is a logarithmic function why is a logarithmic function great um, if you if you go to wikipedia and see search uh, the number of uh, atoms that are there in the visible universe um, i think it mentions around uh, 10 power 80 or something roughly right now if you try to turn that into uh, a 2 power right um, a 10 can be roughly 2 power 3 Right? So it's like 2 power 3 uh, whole raised to the power 80. Right? So roughly 2 power uh, 240 or 2 power 300, let us say. Right? So there are like 2 power 300 atoms in the visible universe, according to Wikipedia. So if all those um, atoms were arranged in some sorted form, right, you could still find the atom that you were interested in in 300 operations. 300, right. Just 300 operations using binary search, correct? So that's how powerful the logarithmic function is, right? So it cuts down the problem into half at every stage, at every iteration, right? It's so powerful because it's exactly the opposite of exponentiation, right? So if you can go from 1 to 2 power 300 uh, in x units of time, you can go from uh, 2 power 300 to 1 also in x units of time if you apply a logarithmic function. Right? So these are very, very powerful functions. So we should know what actually leads to a logarithmic function. Okay. So to summarize, just to put, it, uh, put everything together on one slide, uh, this is what I want you to uh, digest. This we saw anyway, this inwards column. Uh, focus on the typical activity the array indexing right if you can do something which will directly uh, result in saying hey give me the ith item in the array it's a constant operation a hash table it's it's a very very useful and very important data structure um, not only from the interviews point of view but the practicality uh, point of view um, you will be dealing with uh, a lot of implementations of hash tables. In fact, one of the uh, popular questions in interviews is to implement a hash table. Okay, let's say we have a requirement of finding something uh, very quickly. That's all our intention is. Right? We have some numbers here, like this. Right? Our intention is to quickly say, hey, is something existing? And I need to say, okay whether that is part of this list or not right? so typically you would do a linear search right if i say is 15 existing you go over all the elements and say no it's not there right so it's a it's an order of n algorithm which is a linear search right but can we improve can we do something more uh, interesting than that one way to do that is using hash tables right so let's say this is our hash table and what we do is we have a hash function which tries to map these numbers randomly to some cells right so let us say we are, um, we are we are having a hash function which does a mod 10. it's a very bad very bad hash function by the way right so you take some number and you do a mod 10 of that so this is our hash function so 30 mod 10 what does it give you Zero. Zero. So we want to put that in this bucket here, 30. 
So this is a link list of numbers. Then 13 mod 10. Three. So I want to put this here. Right? Then 12 goes here. 5 goes here. And 10 is linked here. 6 goes here. 33 goes here. Okay, so this is our hash table. So this is just an array of pointers, and this pointer points to the first node in the let's say a two linker list. Okay, so now you can throw in more numbers. Like as you add more numbers to the array, you basically hash them into some some slot, right? This is using this hash function. This is your key. This is your hash function. Now, whenever someone says, "Hey, is 15 there?" What do you do? You simply apply the uh, hash function, right? You say 15 mod 10 is 5. So you simply go to this 5 cell and start looking for 15. So you just go over one element and say, no, I don't have 15. I ran out of the list. Right? So very easy. So what is the complexity of that? What is the worst case complexity of this algorithm where we use the hash table? So O of 1? Worst case. Well, O of 1 is uh, constant. It's the best case, right? So basically, yeah. Yeah, it will be O of n. Okay. Now, now that's a tricky question because it depends on uh, how many elements in the worst case you will end up having in each bucket, right? What is the worst bucket that is possible? So, what if the numbers that you were uh, having in the array are, let us say, your um, tax returns, right? you are filing some income tax and your IT department is using your hash table. Now they ask the, the CAs or people who file their taxes to round off their number to the nearest zero. right? So now everyone will be ending with a zero. So if you try to hash that, everyone goes in the zeros bu zero bucket. Right? So you see a problem with so that? It's like the problem itself. Right. So then what happens is now you just end up having everyone in the zeroth cell. So your hash table isn't very, very useful at all. Right? So the worst case of a hash table still remains order of n if your hash function is really terrible. Right? So to avoid that problem, what people do is use a, a nice a large prime number in this place. Right? So you look at the properties of a prime number. Let us say instead of 10, it was just like a 7. Right? So we, we are talking about this problem. Right? Everyone is like this. With a mod 10, what will happen is everyone will map here. Correct? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Everyone goes here. With mod 7, what happens? In which bucket do they go? 7 is a prime number, so we'll just take some prime number. So 10 mod 7. Ten mod seven. What is ten mod seven? Ten goes to three. Three. Twenty mod seven. Six. Six. Thirty mod seven. Two. Two. Five. Five. One. Right. So already it is random, right? So I don't have to really worry about uh, this guy being a multiple of a large prime number because that large, that large prime number is generated randomly it's it's a, it's a subject in itself how to generate large prime numbers right how to find a, uh, that a large number is prime and th things like that so um, that itself is a huge field uh, in cryptography huge field of mathematics within cryptography right so but anyway so assuming that there is a large prime number we don't have the problem of everyone mapping to the same bucket which is why we choose a large prime number here the downside, of course, is you will end up having a lot of cells here, which, is empty, which are empty, correct? If I, if I choose a huge number here, I essentially have to allocate a, an array which is as big as the number itself, correct? Because the mod can go from 0 to that number minus 1. Yes or no? Yes. Right? Yeah. Which is the downside. So you have to be, you have to find a balance, right? You don't choose a uh, prime number which is really, really large. Okay? Uh, at the same time, you don't choose something which is really, really small. So if you can balance that in a in a hash table, uh, especially in a hash function, then uh, the concept of hashing is great. It works pretty well. 
right? Um, so um, assuming you have a good hash function and you have a nice implementation of it, you don't have a lot of uh, data elements which map to the same uh, bucket here, which is why it is known as a constant time uh, algorithm, constant time uh, data structure. Right? Assuming it is fairly randomly distributing your data across all the cells. Right? The idea behind hash table is clear? Yes. Yeah, it's clear. Huh. And uh, then we have uh, manipulating double linked list. Right? Uh, what I mean by that is if you have a pointer to a random node in a two-way linked list, it's quite easy if you want to just uh, delete this guy. Why? I have the previous pointer, so I can go to the this location and change this guy's next to my next, right? So I can I can make this guy like this, and I can go to the next and then make its previous as my previous. So I can change this pointer like this, and then I can delete this safely, right? So manipulating a two-way linker list is uh, quite easy if I'm given a pointer to a random node. Right? Likewise, inserting a node is also uh, fairly easy if you have a two-way linked list. So just remember that uh, these things are giving you order of one. Uh, especially, there are applications of these in uh, designing a cache. Right? That's a very popular question again. Uh, like, how would you design a cache? Right? Um, we'll discuss that eventually uh, when we go to a stage where we are designing things. We will uh, take up that exercise as well. So we saw uh, binary search, balanced VST uh, as logarithmic. And this is easy to see. Parsing an array one way or both ways is linear. Right? Uh, we talked about these three sorts falling in this bucket. And other sorts, other nested loops being polynomial. And uh, combinations being exponential and permutations being factorial, right? So this is kind of uh, a few operations that you can do and uh, this is where they map to. Um, this is yet another uh, representation. All right, the question. Uh, one of the uh, most important uh, um, aspects of problem solving is recursion not from an implementation perspective per se, but from breaking down the problem in terms of its sub-problems, right? So it's like this. I give you some task. I say, okay, I want the solution to this problem. And however, you are free to delegate that problem to your friends, right? You can ask your friends to solve it, but there's only one caveat. The caveat is you cannot give the exact problem to your friends. Right? So whatever problem I give you, you cannot take the same problem and give it to your uh, friend. Right? So you're allowed to cheat. You can solve only a small bit of it, and then you can give it to your friend and say, okay, go ahead and you solve it. Right? So that, that amount of cheating is allowed. So that is nothing but your recursion. Right? You solve just one step, and then you call yourself again. If the next instance will solve a bit of it, then again it will call the third instance, and so on and so forth. So there are two uh, really uh, widely used uh, approaches when it comes to recursion. So one is the top-down, and the other is the bottom-up. Right? So how does uh, a top-down approach look like? So I have a couple of templates here, um, which I build myself. This will help you solve a lot of recursive problems in the top-down approach without having to break your head every single time you come across a problem which needs to be solved recursively. Right? Just get used to this template and you see how easy you can, uh, how easily you can solve the problems. So the idea is this. You start with the main function and you give the complete problem here. You pass the full problem as a parameter and you pass a, an empty solution as a, another parameter. That solution uh, may be one parameter or n parameters. It doesn't matter really. So it's a collection of parameters, right? The full problem, an empty solution. And then the recursive function will do this. If the problem at this point is uh, trivial, 
or, or if it is empty there's nothing to be solved really then then you say that okay whatever solution is passed to me that is the solution i just process that and i return right so if a trivial problem is given then solution is uh, that is passed in this as a, a second parameter is actually the solution so i print that solution process or whatever and i am done i return from the recursive instance if that is not the case this is the step that i want to do i want to break that problem remember the cheating thing i want to uh, just deplete that a little bit into new sub problems right and when i do that i want to say okay the solution that was given to me improves a little bit because i broke the problem i depleted the problem so i enrich the solution so i get a new solution and then i do the the recursive aspect i just say okay i depleted a problem so i got a new problem or a possibly a group of new problems i'll i'll solve them recursively and i enrich the solution which i want to pass to the new instance of the recursion right so let's let's uh, keep this slide and uh, try to solve a problem so it will be very clear okay we want to do this find all subsets of the word a b c d so you have a string a b c d we want to find all subsets of this right so what is a subset uh, there is a empty subset well nothing is part of it uh, it could be a b c d right these are all valid subsets right uh, there could be a b a c a t b c b d c d right and then you have uh, a b c right a b d a c d right b c d a b c d like that right a subset which contains nothing a subset which contains only one character a subset which contains uh, two characters and three and everything basically so how do i approach this kind of a problem uh, you can start off with a base case uh, say uh, if the length of the string is 0 or 1 then you return the element itself or if the length is 0 then simply that Hmm. so that's a trivial case right if the problem is just having a character or it's not even having anything then uh, i know the termination condition right so let's let's try let's try to apply that template so i want to apply that template and look at the code a few lines of code right so what am i doing here this is again c++ so we can easily map this to any language of your choice so i have a comb function which is the combinations and the first one is a problem in a b c d is the problem parameter and solution is empty right so far uh, i have not solved the problem so this is the problem that is being given so the solution is not known it's empty then what does the recursive instance do here it basically says if the problem is empty then whatever was passed to me in solution is the solution so i just print the solution and then return right this is a base condition if not then i have two choices what are those two choices i can take the first character from the problem and i can append it to the solution and say uh, to my friend hey why don't you solve this problem for me because i am allowed to cheat right so i can say uh, you solve the problem for b c d where a is already the part of the solution right so you call one friend and say please solve b c d with a as the solution and you call another friend and say hey can you solve b c d with empty as the solution right let us build the tree let us build the tree because the recursion uh, you have to get used to building the tree otherwise it's it's hard to get your head around okay so this is the problem a b c t and m t right this is the problem the solution what did i do i i told my friend that hey can you please solve b c d for me 
and I'll take this A and I'll put at the end of the solution, which is empty plus A is A. Right? And I told my other friend that I don't want A to be part of this solution. I just want to drop it. Right? It's a subset. So A may be there, A may not be there. Right? So I told him, hey, can you solve B, C, D for me? And the solution is nothing. Like whatever the empty thing was passed, I passed the same thing to you. So I silently dropped A. And I'm done. Now this guy says, oh, I am not allowed to you know, give the same thing to others. So let me cheat. So what do I do? Uh, I'll silently say, okay, B can be part of a subset. B may not be part of the subset. So I apply the same thing. I say, okay, let me call someone else and ask him to solve for CD. And this B, I can put at the end of this A. So whatever solution was given to me. So I can say A, B. Or I can call another friend and say, solve me for CD. And I'll give the A as it is. I will not, I'll simply drop the B, the first character. Right? So you see how a problem is depleting into a new subproblem and how a solution is being enriched into a new solution. Right? So you, you try to build this tree. Uh, I, I would encourage you to take a, a pen and a paper and please draw it on your end so that you know what is going on. Right? The same thing. Now this instance will say, uh, okay, let the, someone solve it for D. I want to take AB, the solution, and the C, put it at the end of it and give it to this guy. The other instance is D with just AB. Right? And so on and so forth. Now this guy is completely depleted. By the time you come here. So you will say solve it for MT, comma, A, B, C, T. The other option is solve it for MT, comma, A, B, C. For this guy. So whoever is trying to solve this, now he's the lucky guy. He says, oh, you didn't give me any problem. You gave me empty problem. So I, I just say, whatever you gave me is the answer. So he just print ABCD and he's done. He goes back to his friend and say, I solved it. So likewise, this guy will also say, hey, you give me an empty problem. So I don't have anything to solve. So ABC is the answer. And he goes back to this scholar. Right? So likewise, now this instance returns to its parent. So his parent now calls the right instance and so on and so forth. So this is how the recursive calls are made. So this is a top-down approach. We began at the top and we started delegating the problems, the sub-problems to new instances. And they solved a part of it and then further they gave it to uh, their own uh, friends. Until the solution was found in the leaf node here. Right? All the leaves have the solutions. Whenever you come to this place, they have a solution. Right? These are the guys who are printing the solution. If you look at the code, this is the leaf node. Let's put this in action and see. Right? So this is the code. This is the output. And I want you to also pay attention to the template. So this is the top-down approach. Okay? So here, you see this. I'm passing the full problem and the empty solution, so which is this here. ABCD is the full problem. I want to find all combinations in ABCD and I don't have a solution. I'm just beginning now. So what does the recursive function do? It has a problem at this point and then the solution so far. So the, the variables corresponding to that are prob and sol. Now, if the problem at this point is trivial or it's empty, then I have nothing to do. So I simply process the solution so far. So solution so far is this. So whatever you gave me, I'm supposed to process it. So that processing could just be printing or, you know, remembering, adding it to something, whatever it could be. Right? And then I return. I return what? I return nothing. I just return from the execution. I don't return a value. That's a feature of a top-down approach. Right? So as you're going from the, the root node all the way to the leaf node, you get the solution. The leaf node actually has the solution. So he prints the solution. So he has nothing to give to the parent because he has, he's done. Right? So which is what we are doing here. If the problem is empty, we print the solution and we return. If not, then we look at this option. Deplete the problem at this point into new subproblems. So how do we deplete? So that, that is the only thing where people get stuck. Like how do I reduce a problem into sub-problem? 
it is actually a foundation of uh, recursion or divide and conquer and uh, dynamic programming how do you take a problem and break it into sub problems related sub problems so in this case this is what we did take the first character and add it to the solution take the first character don't add it to the solution those are the only two possible sub problems for this now why why first character well you can take any character really you can start from the end also it's a symmetric problem right and which is what is leading to this uh, this tree here right so this a can be part of a solution so the left child is basically where a is part of solution the right child is where a is not part of the solution right so there are two possibilities for a here and at this level there are two possibilities for a this is this level is all about a and then this level is all about b two possibilities of b this level is all about c this level is about d so there are two possibilities for a it can be in it can be out and with each of those two possibilities b has two options b can be in b can be out so which is why this guy is giving you two and this guy is giving you four with a being in b has two choices b is in or out with a being out b has two possibilities b being in or out likewise c has double uh, the number of possibilities that b is giving you right so at each level which is why your tree is doubling in size so here you had one problem now here you have two problems this guy and this guy and here you have four problems and here you have eight problems so this is proportionate to uh, to power n right so now as many characters that you have in this original string the 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 tree is doubling at every level so what about what is the take away from this what is the take away from this if at all you come across a code which looks like this where the function is broken into two calls of same type and the length of the input is reduced by 1 so you can say that it is an exponential code right mentally you can just look at the template and say oh you you are dependent on the length of the input first of all and then every time you are making two calls so it is a 2 power n right in other words what if i did not have this branch let's say i comment this i always include that guy in the in the solution what would you get so what happened you see the output right so i began with this problem a b c d and m t right now this guy made only one branch if you see right the code there is only one branch here what is that branch saying a oh, new problem without a b c d a new solution with a a on this guy internally again says only one branch cd is the problem ab is the solution and this guy again says d is the problem abc is the solution and this guy says uh, mt is the problem abcd is the solution now he hit the leaf node right so he'll just print abcd and then he say go back now so he'll say go back because there is no other branch to execute right there's only one line so go back go back go back you're done so what you got is just abcd that is nothing but your linear function really right so your algorithms your code can go very fast from being a linear to being an exponential just because of one recursive call just one recursive call if you slip it in inside a recursive function then the, your ex, your complexity just bloats like that right right so that is why you have to be very very careful when trying to come up with code which looks like this if you are making multiple recursive calls even more than one just one is linear two is two power n three is three power n right so that's how fast it grows if you are branching into those kind of sub problems so let's take another problem how do we find all anagrams of the word a b c d in other words it's just the permutations of the word a b c d so let's say we our problem is um, a b c and mt okay this is our problem what are the sub problems now 
I need to move A to the solution set. I need to deplete the problem. I need to enrich the solution. So one sub problem is I can tell my friend, hey, can you solve BC given A? Because now I just moved this to here. So I cannot drop A. I have to move it to the solution space. So that's one sub problem. So I got a sub problem. What could be another sub problem? A may still be a part of the problem. So B is the one that may be going here. Right? So this becomes AC comma B. And the other possibility is C goes C into the be. solution and AB remains in the problem space. Right? So basically, we are enriching the solution. We are depleting the problem. Right? Maybe. So what is, whatever is the length of the string, we have as many branches here because we are taking one guy at a time and putting it in the solution space. Right. Right. So now if, if there are three here, so there are three branches here. Okay. What about this guy now? I can put B in the solution or C in the solution. So two branches. So there are the two length of the input here is two. The problem is two. So the branches are two. So I can say C comma A B. Right, B went here, or C can go there, B remains here. Right? Likewise, you have two branches here, two branches here. Right? So you had three here. Now here you have three times two. Right. right? Because the input has become of size two. And you have two branches for each of the three. So three times two. This becomes C is only one character, so I just move it to the solution space. So it becomes empty comma A B C. So this becomes empty comma A C B. You can stop this here. Yeah. So this guy is nothing but your three times two times one, right? So what is this function? If it was n instead of three, what would have happened? How many branches at this level? It's a factorial complexity. Hmm. It's a factorial. N factorial. Right, so this th there would have been n branches here, right? And the length of each of these guys is uh, n minus one, because we depleted the problem by one character. So n branches, and each of these guys have n minus one length. So again, this will generate n minus one, n minus one, n minus one. So n times n minus one branches will be here at this level. Likewise, it repeats. So n times n minus one times n minus two, right? So on until one. It's a factorial thing, which is what we want to do anyways. The, the number of permutations of this is actually in factorial anyways. So it has to tally. The, whatever trees that, the, that we are drawing has to tally. Hmm. So you see what is happening here? The template remains the same. If the problem is empty, then I just print the solution and I go back. If not, this is what I'm doing here. My sub problems which is this right this is the perm this is a function recursive call the number of times i am calling that function is proportionate to the input which is why i have a for loop right that for loop is basically going over the uh, entire string uh, creating a new problem from the existing problem and erasing a particular character from it. So for the first time, I erase the zeroth character, and the, I move the zeroth character into the solution space, and I call myself. Second time, I erase the first character, I move the first character into solution space, and I call myself. So um, the moral of the story is, if at all you end up calling recursive functions in a for loop like this, like knowingly or unknowingly, uh, you will end up with a factorial kind of a complexity. Just use a template and see how effortlessly you can do this. Given a set of integers, find if it is possible to divide it into two groups. It says that sum of one group is a multiple of phi and the sum of the other is odd. Right? So if, if, if you take this entire array here, what I'm saying is, can I divide this array into two groups? So, which means uh, you should start thinking about this a problem now. Right? Because in the template, what is the key? The key is basically how to break it into subproblems. The, the rest of the stuff is the same. If the problem is empty, you have found the solution. 
you look for the the solution space variables to see if you have an answer right that's that's trivial the the main part is if the problem is non empty how do i take one step closer to generating the new sub problem so in this case what would you do you take a number and you cannot throw it away you can either put it in group 1 or put it in group 2 because you are asked to divide it into two groups so initially both the group groups will start as empty groups right and then we keep right perfect so i'm updating them perfect yeah so now uh, let's let's look at the code actually uh, here is a problem a we have some numbers and this guy tells me the number of elements in the array a right these two form the problem space a is the array and the length of, length of the array number of elements in the array and 0 comma 0 is the sum of the group 1 and uh, sum of the group 2 right i just want an answer whether it is possible to split it in such a way or not that's all i'm not interested in the numbers per se let's look at the recursive function so what is the recursive function doing here this guy so what is the base case what is the trivial case the happy case when n is not there meaning when it becomes zero and this is c so you can basically uh, write code like this uh, when n becomes zero you want to go inside and do something right so what is it that you are doing when you uh, when you go inside when n is zero it means that you exhausted all the numbers there is nothing to divide so you are so you are checking okay uh, is s1 mod phi equal to zero meaning uh, is the sum divisible by 5 and is the sum in the second group odd you simply do s2 mod 2 is 1 to find out if it is odd or not right that is one possibility or the other possibility is that this guy s1 could be having the sum which is uh, odd and s2 could be having the sum which is divisible by 5 right remember the original problem can we break it into two groups such that sum of 1 is a multiple of 5 uh, and the other is odd so this this is the condition basically so we don't know which one is which right so we are checking for both possibilities here if that is the case i print and i exit right i don't want i'm not interested in all such groups so i just want to see if it is possible or not print that and exit outside of this inner for loop we have a return which means basically anyway we don't have numbers left now but right? n is 0 so there is nothing to be done so i just return here if that is not the case i if i had more numbers if i had more numbers then i cannot uh, check s1 and s2 according to the problem because i am supposed to divide everything into two groups right so now this is what i'm doing take the element uh, the last element because n indicates the length of the uh, number of elements in a so um, that's why i'm saying a of n minus 1 right so take that guy add to s1 that is one sub problem or take that guy and add to s2 that is another sub problem so what is this uh, complexity going to be uh i said 2 to the power of n hmm. it is exponential if you look at it this is exactly the same as the combinations thing instead of throwing away the number we are just putting it in a different bucket 